that we are talking about a biological response to EMF. I'm not limiting it to the cell phones, although that's the topic of this uh, talk, but I think we can get a lot of insight into what the effects of radio frequency are in, uh, on the biological system by trying to understand how EMF works, because we will find that the stress response is not limited to radio frequency. The stress response occurs across the, e the EM spectrum. The stress response occurs in ELF, in the power frequency. It occurs as high as the ultraviolet, which is way above the radio frequency. So you've got a vast expanse of EMF where you activate the same biological responses. And I think one of the advantages of studying the EMF uh, the stress response as an EMF kind of phenomenon is that you can work at a level of energy input where you can rule out a certain number of things happening and you can study the very subtle kinds of interactions that may lead to, our, uh, to the biological endpoint. Now, stress is, comes in two sizes. Uh, the large economy size, which we're all familiar with, which is the uh, adrenaline, cortisol kind of response where the body kind of gears up, you know, the, f the fight, flee uh, kind of uh, uh, responses that an organism uh, is capable of. That is system-wide and it's mediated by these uh, transmitters that go throughout the system. But there's a second kind, the cellular stress reaction, which occurs locally. That occurs in cells themselves and it happens very quickly. And this is a very potent thing. It occurs in most cells, not all, and, uh, but it occurs in enough of them to think that it's pretty universal. It certainly occurs across the uh, phylogenetic tree. Now, the stress response has been much studied. It started out being a response to high temperature, and uh, there's a good review of that in the annual reviews of physiology by Colts, I believe I'm, well, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. But he uh, defined the stress response as a defense reaction of cells to damage that the environmental forces inflict on macromolecules. The macromolecules that are being damaged are the proteins and the DNA. And this is uh, the evidence that reinforces this view is that a lot of the genes that are activated in the stress response are those that detect the damage and that also helped to repair the damage. So this is a universal kind of thing. It's not a single kind of uh, gene that's turned on, but a variety of genes that are turned on, all aimed at correcting the damage. Now, uh, I'd like to, the third point that I have listed there is that the causes, the molecular damage to DNA is a process that is implicated in the genesis and the development the, uh, of, of cancer. So that when we talk about molecular damage, we are already on a pathway that could conceivably lead to the kinds of endpoints we're all worried about. Now, the heading I have on this is that cells answer the EMF safety question. Now, one of the problems we have is we've got, <laughs> we want to know are cells safe in this kind of an environment, and how do we ask the question? I mean, we, can, we need an interpreter. Well, the cells are, speak a language that we are able to understand because the stress response is activated by a whole bunch of different noxious elements that are eventually harmful. When you have high temperature, when you have high acidity, these are all things that cells react to and they tell you by turning on the stress proteins that the cells are in danger. They are sending out a 9-11 signal, they're sending out an SOS, they're telling you and they're giving you the answer. The cells tell you that, these, that this EMF is potentially harmful. That's pretty clear. I don't think you need a weight of evidence to, uh, to answer this question. It's clear that cells are telling you that they are in potential danger. Now, cells react to, uh, the last line on this slide, cells react to EMF as potentially harmful. No question about that. The other thing that the cells tell us is that the SAR is totally inadequate as a measure of what's going on. Now, because the stress response is activated in across the EM spectrum, we can see the energy that's involved in turning on the stress response in different parts of the spectrum. If you look in the ELF range, you can estimate how much energy is being applied to the cells, and we've done this when we turned on the cells in, with a 60 hertz signal. We get something like 10 to the minus 12 
watts per kilogram. And then you compare it to what's uh, needed to turn it on in the radio frequency, and you get 10 to the minus 1 watts per kilogram. My God, this is a difference between thermal, non-thermal. Biology is not reacting to this. Obviously, there's some energy that's perturbing the system, but it's not the energy that's turning it on. And energy is an irrelevant parameter here. A safety standard, and this is on, on the bottom, a safety standard cannot vary with frequency. A biological standard is needed to replace the SAR as a safety standard. This is a point that we made very strongly in, in the uh, Bioelectromagnetic Society Journal. It's uh, my colleague and I, Reba Goodman, we've been working on this for many years, and we have made this point, and uh, we stick by it because it's quite clear. And again, you don't need weight of evidence. All you need is just a clear indication that this response, this is a biological response, response to potential danger that's telling you that's being turned on by different levels of energy. Energy cannot possibly be a way of dif differentiating between whether something is working or not working. I've collected here this an early slide, so I haven't uh, done much updating on this. So you see some of the early dates, but this is a list of thresholds. The second set there, biological synthesis of stress protein, is lists the levels at which these uh, stress responses are elicited, and you see they're very low in the ELF. But it's not unusual. There are a lot of ELF systems, a lot of systems, biological systems that are activated by ELF. The top level there, the uh, biological systems that accelerate reaction rates, and this is in the sodium potassium ATPase, the cytochrome oxidase, uh, ornithine decarboxylase, Belusov-Jabotinsky reaction, which is the oxidation of malonic acid. All of these things have been measured. We've done some of these things, and we find that the thresholds are very low. And you see they're in the milligauss range. If you look at the very last line, you will see that the safety limit that is set by ICNRP is 1,000 milligauss. My God, can you see the, this, the vast difference? These are orders of magnitude differences between the, uh, the biological, the, the, uh, what's needed to start a biochemical reaction or to activate a biochemical reaction and the safety limits that set. Now, I'm not saying when you start a reaction, it's going to be unsafe. I'm just saying that the thresholds are so low that you've got to think again about the levels that are set that are uh, presumed to be safe. I don't think anyone has established the fact that these reactions are, uh, are important. These aren't exotic reactions, by the way. Uh, the cytochrome oxidase is a very vital reaction that occurs in mitochondria that's needed to generate ATP, the very fuel that is needed to generate the gradients, by the way, that the sodium potassium ATPase generates when it operates. So these are central kinds of reactions inside the cell metabolism. And these, uh, these are, I'm sure, not atypical. I think lots of reactions would be involved. <coughs> Now, these EMF effects that I've been just talking about in the previous slide are particular kinds of classes of effects. You see, the first group was an acceleration of electron transfer reactions. Well, when you accelerate electron transfer, you are accelerating the possibility of oxidative damage to proteins, to, dam uh, to DNA, and these are processes that damage is bad for cells and it's bad for these macromolecules that carry the biological information that we need to sustain ourselves. The second class, when you stimulate DNA to synthesize proteins, no matter how good the body is, there are always errors associated with the generation of the biosynthesis. You always end up, the estimates are that with all the correction mechanisms that exist in biosynthesis, you can end up with one in a billion errors that survive the correction system, which means that you're always going to end up, when you activate a system, you're going to always end up with some kind of damage. And damage is a bad thing to, to accumulate. And the third thing, the third point I have there about to stimulate DNA damage, that's an obvious one, because if you got damage, you got the possibility of having that damage remain in the DNA, in which case it's a mutation, and that you've got these mutations accumulating and eventually on the course to uh, cancer, which is the end point that we we're also worried about. Now, these reactions occur across the EM spectrum. They've been, they've been studied in the ELF range, but they occur across the EM spectrum. 
Now, it's possible to conceive of a, of a mechanism whereby something can happen even in the ELF range where there's very little energy involved in activating these processes. And this is the chain of events that uh, I've written here on the slide, and you'll see that there are elements in the chain that one can put together and, and provide evidence for. This. By, mean, no, by no means is there a proof that this is a mechanism, but this is a, a plausible mechanism, and one for which there's, there are bits of evidence that one can certainly conceive of as being active, uh, acting together. 